Hello, good morning. It is the last Saturday of the month. <laughs> so once again, we're doing our monthly book scope on Party of One, Single Success. This is my book, and I am Luana Helena. If it's your first time tuning in or replaying, I um, will do a brief reintroduction of myself. I am the author of Party of One, Single Success, and it's just a guide, not just to being single or how to be single. I think, you know, we kind of figured that out on our own, but how to be a single success, how to be good at it. <laughs> so um, we will go through, so far we've gone through a little bit of the book, starting in January on the last Saturday of every month. Hello, live in peace. Thank you for joining us. So on in January, we pretty much just come so if you're just tuning in, um, this is what you've missed. And all of the videos are saved on my YouTube channel, Luana Helena, El Helena. Um, we talked about the cover, and at the back of the book, I talked about why I wrote the book. Um, that it's the book I wish I read when I was, you know, maybe 14 years old. We think of, when we say singles, we think of adults. And really, you know, most of your life, adolescent life leading up to adulthood is single. So um, it's actually a good read for if you have like young, younger people in your life as well with graduation coming up. You know, it's probably a good little gift to slipping among all the other gift cards and fun toys and things. And um, then we got into the introduction in February of what kind of inspired the book, where I was, when it all happened. And then last month we got finally to the introduction and started to redefine success. So we'll do a recap of that and then we'll continue with today's theme or topic which is just called One Thing. Figuring out your one thing. Why, you know, why are you here? So before we go any further, just a quick prayer. Thank you again for joining us or catching the replay if you are. And God, I just ask you to be with us in this time. Thank you for giving us insight and wisdom and knowledge into why we're here, why you created us, and helping us to figure out um, what it is that you have planned for us to do with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So, last month we talked about success, redefining success. And I had given an example of, you know, using the single success hashtag and finding so many variations um, that pretty much covered what people thought single success was. Like somebody, my favorite one, which was just funny to me, was somebody who killed a roach on her own and she didn't have to call a guy to do it. And she, you know, had a tweet that said hashtag single success. So we have all these different um, definitions. For some people, it's a financial statement or a number. When I am at this salary, I'm a single success or a certain house or car or whatever. So we just got all on the same plane and it does that in the book. Before we even get into the chapters, the book just kind of gets all the readers on the same plane of what is success. And of course, the definition we got is biblical because the whole book, Party of One Single Success, is really a parallel um, between our lives what cues and clues and tips we can get from the life of Jesus, who was the ultimate example, the best example of single success. He came on earth knowing he would be single. It was never a question. And he had a goal. He had a one thing to accomplish, which we'll talk about. And then he completed it and he left us perfect example, like the perfect roadmap. Uh, so if we parallel that, lay it you know, side to side with our lives, then we should be able to know where we're going from there. So last week we talked about that success basically came down to, you know, when God is with you and true success is when what you do not only affects you but affects others, of course, positively. So we looked at the life of Joseph briefly and we'll look at him again today as well. And it was just that part, um, that verse in Genesis that said, the Lord was with Joseph and he was successful and prosperous, though a slave. So we could see that his station in life really had no impact on his actual success. Being a single success he was not affected by his slavery <laughs> or his imprisonment later on. It was pretty much just the Lord was with him. That was success. <laughs> and then the results of that success were that 
he did well, he prospered, and then Potiphar's house and the prison and eventually Pharaoh and the whole of Egypt was all, were all impacted by him being a success. So that's our little recap from last week. So now we want to talk about one thing, the next section in the book. We're actually going through, if you stick with us all year, we will be going through not page by page necessarily, but section by section. So we're talking about one thing today. We have already covered success redefined. And there's a saying by Mark Twain that says the two most important days of our lives are one, when we're born, obviously, and two, when we find out why why we're born. So I can't guarantee that by the end of this scope that will be the day today that you find out why you're born, but I do hope and pray that it will help you to start or continue if you already are searching for that reason. If you if it hasn't been revealed to you yet why you're put on this planet while you're here on the on earth, then hopefully we can start pointing you in the right direction or continue you you know going down that path so we will look at Joseph and we can kind of figure out his one thing his one thing when we look at it is all about dreams I mean he had a lot of other things going on but we can see a recurring theme of dreams he had a dream when he was young he was 17 and he came out and he told his brothers about the dream and then it was another interpretation of dreams in the prison again that kind of put him on the cupbearer's radar so that two years later he could be brought into the palace but what we have to look at and what kind of jumped out at me when I was looking at that is how even though he knew his one thing or you know maybe he didn't know for sure that that was it but he was you know experiencing these occurrences he still had to be processed somewhat through these occurrences. So when he was 17, kind of a boisterous, kind of cocky, you know, whatever, we see that his exact words, and I wrote this down, is from Genesis 37, 6. He just says to his family, kind of, you know, matter of fact, listen to this dream I had. And the emphasis is on I. I had this dream. He never mentions God showed this to me, or I think this might be, you know, something for us to ponder. It wasn't teamwork necessarily. It was, hey, y'all, stop what you're doing. I know I'm the youngest, second to the youngest, but stop what you're doing and listen to this dream I had. So we can see a little attitude issue there. I mean, it, he was speaking the truth. It was truly his dream, but there was still, you know, a little rough edge that needed to be smoothed out. So that's at 17. Now we know his story. His brothers sell him and he ends up, you know, being wrongly accused and going to prison. Now fast forward, he's now 28. So let's see, you know, has he caught on a little bit. He's still dealing with dreams. People are still coming to him and telling him their problems here in prison. And we can see a little attitude change with him, a little improvement, because now he says, well, don't interpretations come from God? He's giving God the credit this time. But he still says, tell me the dreams. <laughs> you know, I'll, giving honor to God, who's the head of my life. <laughs> well, you know, interpretations do come from God, but tell me. Tell me the dream. And then the baker and the cupbearer went ahead and told him the dream. And he thought, okay, this is definitely my ticket out. They see I have a gift, a talent. Be sure to tell me, you know, tell Pharaoh or whoever about me when you're restored to your position. And two more years go by because there's still a little more tweaking to do <laughs> with this thing that Joseph has, which is dreams and dream interpretation. So two years later, he's finally 30. He's come a long way from 17. Pharaoh calls him in and says, now Pharaoh is actually stroking his ego and buttering him up and I've heard that just by hearing a dream you can interpret it Joseph and then Joseph finally catches on by now he's like no nope, not falling for that trap and his words here and I, I always read from the message version but you know it's more or less the same whatever version you go to the point or the gist is the same and Joseph jumps back no not I but God <laughs> God will set Pharaoh's mind at ease. So he finally catches it. Yes, it's my thing. Dreams are my thing. That's what God kind of put me here for, to live out dreams, to dream dreams, to interpret dreams. 
but I have to acknowledge who it came from and I have to use it for him. So once Joseph finally caught that, then, you know, the whole dream was interpreted and lived out for 14 years, seven years of famine, seven years of feast, saved the world pretty much, saved his family, brought his family up from, up to Egypt and, you know, everything went smoothly, more or less from there, um, at least with Joseph and his family. Later on, we know that the Egyptians ended up enslaving the Israelites because they were growing so much. But that, in Joseph's time, in Joseph's lifetime, he saw that dream to completion. So we kind of have to think the same thing. If you think, you know, well, what is my one thing? And what is it that I'm good at? And if immediately our thought is, oh, I'm going to make millions of dollars with my gift <laughs> or I'm going to you know look really smart and really impressive with my gift I'm going to use my gift for writing even to you know sell millions of books and I'm going to use my gift for for me if it's all about me 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 then you might have you know you have some revelation obviously of what your gifting is but you might not get the full picture of what, why you're here gift until you start to yield a little bit of it like okay God you gave it to me you tell me how to use it you tell me what it's for we see the same thing with Jesus again the book party of one single success is a parallel of Jesus's life so if we take his life I mean it looks like he did a lot of things he was healing he was teaching he was preaching he was doing some prophesying he was evangelizing he was telling people you know turning people's hearts back to God in on why did he do every one of those little things it comes down again to one thing he wanted to put creation us everyone back in a right relationship with God to show us God's grace people at the time kind of knew God as legalistic and these are the laws and these are the rules and don't eat this don't touch that if you touch this you know people had died <laughs> for just touching the Ark of the Covenant and you know it just seemed like we were so distant and disillusioned about God so Jesus is one thing if you have to put it in a word is grace like let me show you the grace of my father let me show you you know this side that you haven't seen or you can't really conceive and in doing so get um, everyone reconciled God and man back together again to undo that rift that took place you know before with the fall of man as it's called so we see that through his life too from a time he was a baby just the fact that he took on human form he could have just descended from the clouds one day and say I am your savior I am here to save the world and people probably would have you know been more in awe of that than you know a baby being born among farm animals but taking on that form and coming down to our level is one show of grace even as a baby and then as a child 12 the only um, incident we really have listed or noted in the Bible of Jesus' childhood, study among the religious leaders of the time, maybe try to gauge what is it that they really think, you know, of God. These are the people leading people. What do they know? What do they think? What are they teaching them? Let me sit and study and, you know, kind of see where they're coming from. And then finally, when he gets to 30, just like Joseph's dream was realized at 30 he gets to 30 and he starts his own thing his one thing his ministry and again it's through healing and teaching and preaching and you know his death finally and his resurrection all of it nothing was wasted in Jesus life every single thing he did from the wine turning to water all the way to you know being resurrected from the dead was to lead us and point us in the direction of this grace of God, of this reconciliation, of this coming back and being one, you know, returning to God. So we, he does all of this in three years and leaves and leaves us a pattern. So if there's a pattern, it obviously needs to be followed. So we start to look at our lives, you know, and then wonder, well, what am I supposed to do? I mean, Jesus died once. Nobody else really needs to die for the sins of the world again. But 
why did he go through all of that? Is it just for me to live, die, and go to heaven? I mean, is there anything specific <laughs> I'm supposed to be doing in that meantime? And, you know, we have different verses and parts of the Bible that will tell us that, you know, it's God's will that we're conformed to Christ. But still, what does that mean? Conformed how? What is that supposed to look like? So, we want to take some time and try to figure out what our thing is you know there are millions billions of people in the world and we each have something different or unique that we bring to the world and then leave you know hopefully a uh, legacy behind us when we're gone so it's kind of like when you are job hunting people will tell you if you don't have a job then your job is to find a job so you should be getting up like between nine to five and you know working like you were at work but the work is actually finding work so it's the same thing with your one thing if you are listening to this and going well I don't know what my one thing is I'm good at a couple things I don't know if that's necessarily what God wants me to do with my whole life then our one thing until we figure out what it is is to find out what that one thing is so who better to ask than the person who we believe put us here and created us and designed us to fulfill that one thing so that full-time job until we figure out <laughs> what our real job or one thing is is to seek God to ask him to talk to him and for me what was revealed to me in doing that personally is um, I am here my purpose my writing scopes teaching I taught for 15 years all these different things that I've done or to have yet to do is to help people who are intellectually underwhelmed <laughs> and this is how I knew it wasn't just my concoction because I heard this during a t quiet time with God I'm here to help transform the intellectually underwhelmed into the unapologetically creative and just those two terms kind of came to me I wrote them down I pretty much knew what they meant but I went and still looked up a definition <laughs> occupation one thing finder right until you know that one thing then you can't say oh well I'm waiting on the Lord well you know there's some things you can do while you wait for that answer is to you know seek he promises if you seek you'll find God is not a liar so if you don't know what your one thing or purpose here on earth is then start actively seeking become a one thing finder <laughs> it's a good occupation in the meantime so just the way those terms came to me, I knew it wasn't something I had concocted or made as my mission statement or anything. It just kind of came, I wrote it down, looked up the specific definition, made sure I understood it correctly. And, you know, someone who's intellectually underwhelmed kind of sounds like an insult <laughs> at first, but it's really not. It is actually a huge compliment because you're intellectually capable of processing so much more. But whether it's the educational system, the religious system, whatever environment you're in, it's underwhelming you. It's giving you so little. You can do this much and this is all they're feeding you. So this gap here is frustrating you. So <laughs> that is what an intellectually underwhelmed person is. And I started to see more of those students kind of pop out in my classroom. I taught 10 years in the classroom and five years online and especially when I started to get into the online um, teaching environment I could see a lot of those kids working from home where I can see why they, why they dropped out or decided to go to an online school because they had so much more going on. They would call or talk or text or we'd chat back and forth on Skype and they'd have so many deeper ideas into text and into, I remember a student showed me something in The Life of Pi that, I mean, I read it and seen the movie and never thought of it. And she mentioned it and I was like, oh my gosh, that's cool, it, you know. So I started to see, okay, I'm here to help those adults like that too and even um, I like I feel like God led me back or well, Holy Spirit took me back to my <laughs> area or my time of intellectual underwhelm 
and it started in second grade. So, I mean, I was seven, that's a distant memory for me. And to be taken back there when I was kind of questioning, well, what does that mean? What's intellectual underwhelm, <laughs> you know, versus creativity and so on. And he just kind of took me back to in kindergarten, first grade, you know, you were, I was kind of the outgoing, extroverted, kind of bouncy kid. I had a little, um, I don't know what you would call it. <laughs> my teacher, my first grade teacher, just referred to it as Luana and her allies. But I guess it was kind of like the godfather. <laughs> People would ask me to do favors for them. But it was, <laughs> it was kind of like bullying the bullies. Yeah, I wouldn't bully a kid. But if a kid came and said, so-and-so took my pencil or he's hiding my backpack or whatever, my friends and I would kind of get on the case <laughs> and we'd make that boy give her back her pencil and you know we tell the teacher or we you know we we had an agency you could kind of come to us and we'd set it straight and if we was out of our hands then we'd go to the teacher so that was kind of me in kindergarten first grade kind of a regulator the equalizer I guess without the trench coat and then I got to second grade and it's kind of like I don't know I don't want to blame the teacher, but it could have just was a, a certain set of circumstances, we'll say that. And um, I remember specifically, like, you know, we had to take a word and make a sentence out of it. So one of the words was world. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, everybody, typical, oh, the wind is picking up. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks for letting me know. I might try to go inside. <clears throat> So make a sentence with the word world. If you're seven, most kids are like, the world is round. We live in the world, you know, and then you'd get a check off on that and, you know, get your A and whatever. But I'm like, okay, that's too easy. That's too simple. Hold on. Let me see. Well, they didn't say it had to be a declarative statement. So I'm going to make it an interrogative statement. I'm going to say, where in the world have you been? Question mark. And that was my sentence I made out of world. And I got it wrong. <laughs> And I couldn't understand why. I used world <laughs> correctly. You know, it wasn't incorrect. But somehow, I guess they wanted something. Okay, yeah, I put the notebook in front of the mic. So hopefully that helps. But if it's still too windy, I'll just go inside. I just hear dogs barking. That's all I hear. I, don't, I can't tell with the wind. But um, yeah, it's like kind of they wanted to keep it simple. It's kind of like... Yeah, they were ready. <laughs> they were ready for interrogation, interrogative forms in, in second grade. <laughs> so that was kind of my moment of intellectual underwhelm where I'm like, okay, if I stop being all cute and creative and I just write the little sentence, a little boring sentence, I'll get straight A's and mommy will be happy and the teacher will leave me alone and <laughs> everything will be fine. So I think I just kind of ratcheted down my creativity brought it to the level of everybody else got my little a's and then just kind of moved on from there so that was that moment that i was led back to where i was actually a lot more creative as a child and it got nipped or shut down or you know kind of closed off that way but there are, is, uh, I think God was just showing me, I'm not the only one. There are kids like that who I was teaching. There are adults like that who kind of just do the nine to five and keep it moving because, you know, maybe if somebody, if they said, oh, I want to be a writer or singer or an actor or something in the arts, somebody told them, oh, no, you should get a real job <laughs> and then, you know, leave that as a hobby. That kind of brings you down a little bit and closes off your creativity so or limits it in some way so that is what was revealed to me as my one thing so the purpose in doing these scopes once a month or writing this book or you know anything else teaching for the length of time that i did was to you know try to find and help transform anybody who i perceived was um intellectually underwhelmed there was more they could do um, with themselves, their lives, their gifts, their talents, and somehow it was kind of limited and helped them get to that point of creativity and unapologetic creativity, meaning that, you know, they weren't sorry about it, they weren't 
weren't asking for permission. They weren't, you know, they were just writing, where in the world have you been? Question mark. And boom, you better give me my A because it is a semantically and syntactically correct sentence. What's your problem? No apologies. <laughs> so to get back to that point. So to find out that thing, you know, I can't give a step by step, you know, do a quiet time at 5 a.m. and God will reveal your one thing. It's just constant, consistent seeking, whether it's in the morning, whether it's in the evening, boom. <laughs> That's un unapologetic creativity. It's just boom, bam, in your face. And what? <laughs> just using God's gifts without, you know, asking anyone but Him for permission to do it. So, like I said, I can't give steps and, you know, a formula for it, but I just know I was praying, I was asking. It started way back when even the Purpose Driven Life book came out. I read that and I thought definitely by the end of this book, I will know my one thing. And I read it cover to cover and it pretty much said what I'm saying now is seek God <laughs> for your purpose, you know, and then you find your purpose and then your life will be driven by that purpose. So I think that's the only sane um, and practical answer to really give if someone asks what is my one thing or how do I find out what it is is seek God and it's, it's, it, may see, it may sound dismissive you know but it's not meant to be it is the way I find out it's the way most people found out it's the way Joseph knew his purpose I'm sure it's the way Jesus knew his purpose so you know, who are we <laughs> to bypass that system that was good enough for Christ himself? He had to seek God himself to find out what he was here for and what he was supposed to do. So we have to do the same thing. So just in your time of prayer, of reading, of studying, of praising, worship, whatever you already do, just if that is a desire of your heart, just make it known to God. God, I love and appreciate the life you've given me i would like to know you know that what i'm doing is what i was really put here to do and meant to do and i'd appreciate it i'd love it i'd thank you for it god if you would just show me just show me and he might just present a person to you and you might start talking to them and you might end up solving a problem for them and you might figure out hmm that's what I'm supposed to do help people like that or it might come to you in terms or words and you know write down what you hear especially if you can discern that that's not coming from your own imagination then you know write down what you hear and you know go back and reread it so that's kind of it for today I mean I pray that you either start to seek or rediscover or continue to seek your one thing and your purpose that you were put here for and um, I encourage you to purchase Party of One Single Success some of what I more of what I talked about I just kind of touch on a little bit every month but more of it is in the book in um, more detail and next month which will be May 28th I believe we will start on the actual chapters believe it or not this is the introduction, but this is the end of the introduction and we will start on chapter one and um, the remaining chapters pretty much like I said parallel Jesus's life here's what he did as a single man here's what we should do as, as single people in order to achieve the success that he did and we'll start with um, setting and reaching goals. There are certain goals that can be reached not only if you're single, but more easily while you're single. So we'll start talking on talking about getting some of those goals, not just set, but reached, achieved, completed um, while you're single. And then in the following months, we'll go on to that's chapter one. I'm um, chapter two, sorry. And then we'll go on to the next. Um, topic which is enjoying the perks of being single and we'll finally finish up by the time we get to the last few months of the year we'll be talking about relishing the relationships that we do have while we're single so I hope you continue to tune in or at least catch the replays and in the meantime purchase party of one single success it is available in print like it is here it's not a very long book um, I kind of tend to get to the point <laughs> of things and um, it's available in, as an ebook as well on Amazon and as an audiobook 
um, which you can also get is on Amazon, Audible, iTunes, different places. The best place to log in and just kind of get all the information at once is LuannaHelena.com. That's my first name and last name. L-U-A-N-N-A-H-E-L-E-N-A.com and this link is also in my Periscope description. If you click on it, it will take you to my page and it has the links to Party of One, it has the links to other um, audiobooks that I have narrated. That is my job now. <laughs> um, I uh, narrate audiobooks for other authors as well. Thank you. LuannaHelena.com is the website. And then I've also created a meditation CD with just um, verses from the Bible, very soothing music, um, ocean sounds, and it's about 16 minutes. It's called Sweet Sleep, and I, um, it was kind of birthed out of my insomnia. <laughs> I couldn't sleep, and I kept going to different sites and YouTube videos, and nothing quite did it. So I just made my own, and it <laughs> works. I have yet to hear the end of it. Usually I put it on, listen, and, you know, I'm out. <laughs> so if that's something that interests you as well, then definitely check out LuannaHelena.com. Um, here on Periscope, I am at Luana Helena on Twitter as well and Instagram. And then on Facebook, I am L Helena. And there's also a Party of One Single Success Facebook page. Uh, so all of these are great avenues <laughs> or just back to the basic website which has the links to all of these um, it's luannahelena.com so thank you for tuning in replaying and sharing and I'll see you next month and um, I encourage you to take some time and seek God and he I pray that he will reveal to you what your one thing is here why he put you here and um, enjoy your Saturday bye <laughs>